Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at our terrace with George Janik, who is a fellow and advisor, who's going to talk today about uh, timing closure. George, we've heard a lot about timing closure. We've been hearing about timing closure for years now. What's changed there? What's new? So I, I would say today the biggest difference is that most of the SOCs today are purchased out of IP. And each of that, those IPs come typically with their own timing closure methodology, which the IP vendors have solved. The problem is that given the current size of SOCs, the communication, particularly the global communication among those IPs, is largely a problem that's only solvable through basically the design teams and maybe some new generation of tools that needs to come out of EDA uh, and also incorporating IP. A lot of these IP blocks are um pre-made, they're, they're black boxes, they're subsystems, you've got analog pieces in there. Are they harder to put together now than they were in the past? I think the issue is that there's more bandwidth that's required. So each of these IPs has a number of sockets or connectors which are basically moving data in and out of them at ever higher frequencies or wider data paths. Okay, why don't you draw this out for us? Okay, so you know, if you look at uh, an SOC. I'll just kind of stick with uh, some part of the chip. We have some CPU which itself will have some interface that's basically going to read and write uh, to let's say some, uh, to a, I'm just going to use an example of just a DDR controller and some SRAM. So, so this part, you know, essentially data is going to come round trip across the memory and then I also need some kind of a interface to the local SRAM and basically get data back. So, and I may also have the CPU talk to some piece of IP. So I now have sort of these complex communication paths on the chip. And, and the main concern is that, you know, is the distances. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, six, eight, 10 millimeters of wires that, that have to be spanned. And in particular, you know, with RC delays, what we have today is, you know, we started off essentially getting better, but now as wires are basically getting thinner, uh, you have the rebuffered delay going up. So you may end up with, you know, 400 or so picoseconds to one nanosecond per millimeter to make this traversal. So if you look at, you know, trying to traverse, let's say, eight millimeters, across the chip, and let's take an example that the CPU is going to run at, you know, let's say, let's say the CPU runs at 2.4 gigahertz, and its bus interface runs at 1.2 gigahertz. Uh, it means we've basically got a clock cycle of about 800 picoseconds. And that gets worse as you start getting into more, piece, more IP blocks, more uh, modes of operation, things that are partially off, partially on, uh, always on, uh, all fighting for contention for memory in a small space too, right? They're fighting for contention um, because essentially these traffic channels are, chain, are, are, are shared. What you have is you no longer have tri-state buses. So every, every interface, really, if you look at the, the CPU, uh, has to essentially, so if I have two CPUs, I have CPU one, I have CPU2, I have to multiplex that data to get to the DDR controller. And as the DDR controller returns data, I have to basically then demux this back into each of these. So, and imagine that, you know, between sort of these targets and initiators, I have 128 of them. So you can see that the complexity of these multiplexers is very large. And they're also not necessarily firing at the same pace too, right? So if it takes a, a nanosecond for something to wake up, it's going to be a little, potentially a little bit slower along the way. Right, so what you'll see in here is, so let's say we said this is 1.2 gigahertz. What you're really going to have happening is that these two may all be in the same clock domain, but let's say what we have is, you know, you know, a USB uh, SPI interface, let's say in this IP. 
So this interface here may be running at 200 to 400 megahertz. So we have to basically provide some sort of a clock crossing interface. And if this part of the chip can be powered down, then we also have to basically provide a means of dealing with the fact that this part, this part may not be powered off at all. One more factor that comes in here, particularly when you start getting into RC delay, is the thermal impact of some of these things too, which potentially can affect the signal uh, strength as well as uh, the time that it takes for the signals to pass through these wires, right? Right. So what, we, what we're doing is we're basically starting to go, you know, from what used to be negligible of, you know, you know let's say 0 0.1 ohms per micron, you know, now we're getting into 10 ohms to, you know, plus per, you know, per micrometer. So if you think about this, okay, 100 microns is going to give you one kilo ohm. If you look at the output impedance of a good driver, it's probably going to be, you know, somewhere around 800 to 2 kilo ohms. So these wires, so no matter how big I make this driver, if I don't control when I repeat, I can't actually drive the signal. And you know, so what we're looking at in these technologies is a buffer sitting every 200 micrometers on the wire, or maybe even going down to 100 micrometers as we move forward. What's the impact of that? Is it power? Is it performance? Is it cost? All the above? Um, so, so one of the big costs that people don't realize in these interfaces is basically just sheer area of gates. So if you look at the, an AMBA interface on an A72, what you're looking at is a 128-bit data bus, 40-bit address bus. So you're talking about 40, 400 wires going back and forth on this interface. If you put down a large buffer every 100 microns, you've added tens of thousands of gates, each of which have leakage, and each of which have to be switched as data traverses. So the power implications of these networks, if they're not well uh, managed for power control and minimizing activity, can be a significant hit to the active power of a design. There's also a noise factor which comes in into the analog blocks too. How does that affect timing as well? So in the analog blocks in general, the goal is to try to keep them sort of, you know, off in their own sort of isolated little universe and essentially try to keep as much of this sort of noisy multibus traffic off of them. So if I have, let's say, an image processor, I may be able to insert buffers and drive a bus through it. But as soon as I have an analog block or I have a memory, I clearly have to use that as a detour, forcing a lot of wires to then basically take you know, relatively complex paths. But all of these can be impacted on the timing side, right? And the analog as well as the digital. So the digital side, what, what you have is that you kind of have this sort of cycle of, okay, I have 800 picoseconds um, and I need to go Let's, let's take a simple example, and I need to go, let's say, four millimeters. If I'm getting 400 picoseconds, let's say I get one nanosecond. Uh, actually, let, let's, let's take a simple number to make it easy. Let's say I go 800 picoseconds per millimeter. Uh, well, what it means is that I can only go one millimeter per clock period. So if I have to go six millimeters, or eight millimeters as I put it, then what I have to do is I have to come out of my CPU block, go into a flip-flop, go into another flip-flop, go into another flip-flop. Now in between here, the EDA tools are very good at putting in buffers or inverters, more inverters for signal integrity, to essentially minimize you know, what are basically the RC delays, rather than sort of having an exponential behavior, these things have you know, kind of this sort of you know, staircase behavior where they basically have a linear number for the delay. Uh, so as basically these, these sort of points sort of move far apart, we now have the problem that we can't get here in one cycle and I have to essentially insert these registers. Now while EDA is good at managing buffers, it has no hope, it has no capability of saying, I can just put a flip-flop in here. Because it changes the, the state machines and everything else. So what we have to do is not only do we have to send data, 
but we also have to send control. So we say this is valid, and then this is sending back that I'm basically ready. And these are what I call flow control registers. So the management of registers and the insertion of registers into the data path is basically becoming a major issue in how IP is assembled. If you look at it sort of historically, you know, you think of a MIPS CPU as being sort of single cycle, but the minute you wanted to go fast, you had to basically pipeline the data path and put registers in the middle of the multiplier. So here, you have to put registers in the middle of your data, of your communication path, and in order not to confuse signals, you also have to have control that basically says, I have data, I'm ready for data. Let, let's go back to the analog side. What happens there? Okay. So in the, in sort of the, the, the analog, really in a lot of these chips, you have essentially a, so if you look at the chip edge, you have essentially some signals which will go into, you know, a analog front end, which will then produce some amount of data streams, which will then be sort of absorbed by some controller which in general, most of the time, will produce some stream of digital data. So, so you have essentially usually two levels of analog component. This is really sort of split. One is the part that basically deals with the I.O. signals themselves. The part that does the digital, so, so this is really kind of I.O. for analog. This is really analog you know, to digital conversion. And then this is essentially some signal processing to put it into a form where it can basically be passed on to something like a DSP or a GPU to basically make heads or tails of what these signals are really meaning. And it's basically in these connections, you know, with memory where the global part really comes in. Okay, and that all still affects the timing, right? So all these pieces are together in, in the time enclosure. They all have to work. Yes, and you have to know what's basically the bandwidth. So if, if, this, if this channel is a CERTES, and you're going at a, and, and this CERTES, let's say, is converting at you know, 100 gigabits, uh, you're consuming a significant amount of data, and you have to be very careful about that these data paths are wide enough, fast enough, to basically be able to pass the data along. On the other hand, if you're talking to some, you know, analog, let's say, what's, what's a simple analog channel? Uh, well, let, let, let's, let, let's, let's, let's say some, some basically voltage comparator. You know, this data may be coming off at, you know, 100 kilohertz. So you can basically go off, put in some buffer, and really only send out packets you know, sort of the global space only occasionally onto these buses. And so the reason this becomes important is as you start going into something like a, an autonomous vehicle, for example, mm -hmm. you've got all these sensors which are now compiling data at potentially different rates, all right. sending them into the system to be processed potentially also at different rates, and you've got to come out with a, an answer about we're about to go into, get into an accident, which way are we going to go at uh, ridiculously fast speeds, and this is all timing closure too. Yes. So, so what, what's really happening is that in many ways, inside of these chips, everything is basically feeding data in and out. It's largely flowing, being sort of stored in the memories, and then basically being processed by the IP units. So there's kind of two kinds of time enclosure. One is to get the data through all of these controllers. But the other time is involved in software where if somebody basically has a LIN interface to a break, I have to make sure that A, the data isn't dropped because somebody didn't block the bandwidth. I also have to make sure that I basically get back to this interface you know, before you know, the car hits the brick wall. So, the, so, so there's basically both being able to process the bandwidth as well as making sure that the real time analysis performs its function in the desired amount of time. Okay, so then we have, on top of that, we have lots of black boxes that are sitting inside this chip because not everybody gives away all the information on their IP. A lot of times they're developed as subsystems or as yes. 
uh, entire well, units. Ideas. And so now you have to figure out how all these pieces go together, how they're going to communicate, and what the latency is, as well as the throughput on all these different channels, right? Yeah. So in, in this particular case, so there, there's really, the industry has in some sense evolved. Uh, one is that if you look at the LAN interface, you can know, it, it's standard set, this is how much data I can send. Uh, so it's pretty clear that you know what uh, the data rates are. If you have something that's coming at you at a very high rate like video, you also kind of know what you have to do if you want to do you know, 4K Ultra HD, you know uh, what data rates you're processing. The second thing that's made sort of IP actually work is the fact that a lot of these connectors on these IPs are now standard. They're either AMBA buses, you know, they're still OCP, BBCI, Wishbone, other standard sockets. So the IP itself for this, for instance, Lin interface has a standard out here, and in here, it'll have an APB interface, which will be offer, operating at you know, fairly low frequency, but it's all standard. So you know that if you're talking to this, you're talking to app APB, in this case, you're talking to Axi, you know that the DDR controller is talking to a DRAM, which you know what its uh, features are in terms of bandwidth and latency. So the standards have really made the ability to assemble a very complex IP SOC much easier. Does it all function as you expect it to, though? Are all the characterizations on the IP consistent? And um, as you start getting into things like RC delay, where you have uh, physical effects coming off the wires, um, does that impact some of this stuff as well? Right. So what, what happens today is, in general, the people who do the architecture of the integration are architects. They're essentially logic designers. So what used to be the realm of CPU designers, where everything was carefully planned out, all the registers were, in the SLC case, that's really not been the case until recently. And what happens is you can take a perfectly good logical interconnect and have it completely not work when you put it inside the PNR systems. The problem with that is that if you send bad register mapping to a tool like Innovus or you know, to a DC Topo, it will do what you tell it to do, which is the wrong thing. And it takes a long time to run and it takes a long time to debug. So part of it is to start building tools where floor planning is incorporated into sort of the SOC interconnect architecture almost from day one. So is this an EDA problem or is it an IP problem or both? It's an integrated IP and EDA problem. So one, one way you could think of is that RTL is IP agnostic EDA. But if you look at when you buy a CPU or you buy a GPU, you don't get RTL. You get RTL with verification, you get an entire methodology. So in some sense, the EDA vendors provide tools that are basically sold to IP vendors who used to create the IP, and those IPs themselves are now provided with EDA to actually implement them. George Janik, thanks for a great explanation of a very complex subject, and your drawing on the board is a clear example of just how hard this has gotten. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for my drawing, but I, I, I think it is an important problem, and it's not going to go away anytime soon.